We continue our conversations with Vika Kova. Hello. In the previous talk, you outlined the foundation of your land of good society, which is gender harmony. According to your research, the natural alignment between the genders can be the solution to a secure, prosperous life. Therefore, gender harmony will play a key role in land of good. Yes, indeed. Extended research convinced me that gender harmony can cure any problem of any society. Gender, with all its exceptions and variations, is such a significant part of who we are that once it's out of balance, everything is getting out of balance. Restore that balance and everything will fall in its place. There are very hot debates right now about genders. They are the results of uh, long-term suppression by the extremely male-driven Christian tradition that announced sex, birth, pleasure and leisure as sin. These sins are directly related to the female gender. In order to survive Christian era, women were forced to suppress their natural powers. There is a beautiful book by Anne Baring who explains masterly what happened to womanhood and femininity and the impact of it on the society. While our ancestors in the prehistoric times enjoyed and celebrated sex and togetherness, we, the heirs of religious traditions, have to deal with emotional blockade by means of debating it endlessly. In a healthy society, these kinds of debates shouldn't even be. The prehistoric society is a good prototype for a definition of a gender harmony. There are sexes, there are genders, with all their exceptions and variations. There is masculinity, there is femininity, but there are no gender roles or gender bias. Gender harmony is when all people share equal rights and get equal chances, but feel as one. One is humanity that embraces diversity of individuals. Gender harmony harvests from our differences. Feminine or masculine or in the middle, it doesn't matter. Diversity and individuality are enrichments of the society. On one hand, we are all the same, on another, different. On one hand, we all are part of one, on another hand, we are separate individuals. Land of Good will always seek towards the middle, towards the balance. During the first talk, we spoke extensively about women playing a very important role in the prehistoric society. It appears women of that time were leading in communications, internal management, negotiations and interconnections, internal production and craftsmanship or a craftswomanship for that matter. Examples like these are my inspiration for understanding what the real female powers must be. To understand how women of that prehistoric society were, how would they think and act? That society which valued and worshipped women is one of your evidences of gender harmony's possibility. Independent archaeology is your inspiration. Is it your only inspiration? Not at all. Archaeology and its finds of advanced society before 10,000 BC is just the most spectacular and demonstrative inspiration. You can go and see it for yourself at any part of the world, from America to Europe to Asia. Those ancient megalithic structures are pumping up everywhere. Another big source of inspiration is the brain science that taught me that some parts of men's and women's brain function differently. And the studies of the pineal gland, the part of the brain which is now known as the third eye, and is considered to be the source of perception beyond our five senses, such as intuition, premonition, telepathy, um, clairvoyance, uh, out-of-body experiences, all typically female-related qualities that disappeared together with the female powers. 
Another essential inspiration is just meeting people and men of different social classes, positions, doesn't matter, and just listen to their stories. And uh, the biggest inspiration is just the common sense of duality. No one will argue what's more important, the minus or the plus, the day or the night, the darkness or the light. There is not even a question about it, is there? So why is that an issue who is more significant, a man or a woman? Women just have different powers, like do the minus and the plus. However, the sense of duality shouldn't exclude the awareness of oneness. Although we are dual creatures, we are all parts of the whole. Some call it universe, some God, some eternity, whatever suits you. But the majority experiences consciousness and physical body through the duality. So I figured a well-balanced society starts from our dualistic origin. We invested a lot in the yang. I think time has come to explore the yin. What about transgenders and homosexuals? What is their position in land of good? There should not even be a question of any position. It will be entirely your choice which part of yourself you would like to explore at this particular phase of your life. In land of good is very simple. You can do whatever you want as long as it is not destructive for yourself and for people around you. Land of good is never about gender, it's about how good the person is. However, land of good will be aware that homosexuality has a big advantage. It has a capacity to regulate overpopulation, so homosexuality plays an important role. So, the foundation of land of good is clear and looks pretty stable. What is the next step? The next step is to build a structure on top of the foundation. The structure of any society is usually a social organization, a system that contains the fundamental behavioral code. The aim of Land of Good is to find such a social system that would prosper everybody. But right away here we meet our next challenge. For everybody, when everybody is different and wants different things, how can one build a social system that will satisfy everybody? You can't. We analyzed all ever existing social structures per region, per country. There is not even a one country where everybody fancies one same social system. Within the same country, there are lots of different political parties and institutions. Only the majority that wins the elections or take the power by force, they are satisfied. The rest has to live with something they don't really want. It's a good recipe for problems. The USA, for example, is divided in half. So sharing the same culture does not necessarily lead to the same personal preferences when it comes to the social organization. Why? If we are such a social monkey see, monkey do creatures, why don't we just copy each other and do what everybody else does? That would be easier. Where this diversity of opinions and choices come from? To answer this, I had to go to the sources of human preferences. Naturally, I ended up by our ancestors, the apes. Here came a surprise. Apparently, I was kidding myself, thinking that such a humane concepts like democracy, socialism, communism are the inventions of us, homo sapiens. Apparently, all social systems are actually a copy-paste of the societies invented by apes. Apes are mostly very social, they live in groups, all groups are organized, and they organize differently. There is no society that apes wouldn't have. Hashtag shocking. Let me give you a couple of examples. For example, baboons. 
is a strictly totalitarian male driven organization based on rigid pyramidical hierarchy and monogamy. The leader is alpha male, all others from beta to omega are under his superior subordination. His territory is protected by the large strong group, they are strictly organized like an army. They are proud of their coordination and organization skills. Everything is decided through a demonstration of power by alpha male. The aggression of the others is just demonstrative, so the actual violence is rare. Each member knows his or her place. Females are protected by males. Baboons like to stick with one partner and share parenting responsibilities, but can change the partner after the infant is grown. Does it not remind you something? They are smart and proud of their loyalty and patriotism, often protecting alpha male and his possessions with their lives. Such a strict hierarchical system excludes creativity and freedom of opinion, but creates security and stability. The death rate is very low, starvation is very rare. Gorillas is also a strict male-driven hierarchy, but with harem organization where the alpha male has the biggest harem. Males control and protect their females. When infant is grown, he builds his own harem. The biggest the harem, the more alpha is the male. Sounds familiar? They have high infant's mortality rate because of sexually selected infanticide, meaning the killing of babies. Gibbons is a strictly family-driven social organization. They live in big families with their parents and children. Family values are sacred. They are monogamous and get married only when they are in love. Father is a protector and a responsible parent. Good parenting is the first priority. Not aggressive, friendly, they protect their territory by singing. As far as the voice can reach, as big is his territory. Other gibbons hear it and don't trespass. Singing is also a cultural thing. Singing brings family together in harmony. Not vegetarians, omnivores, violence and death rate are very low. And then we have chimpanzees. As a strict, competitive, male-dominated organization. Unstable hierarchy, because groups' coalitions are changing all the time due to ongoing competition for a higher position. Sounds familiar? To get a higher position, males are entitled to kill, to cheat, to aggress and to rape. Death is a strategy to achieve life goals. A higher position in the group can also be achieved by intelligence or unusual organizational abilities. They are smart, but sneaky and tricky, and have low compassion abilities. Their cannibalism takes sometimes repulsive forms. Females can attack infants of the other females and devour the babies still alive in the presence of their mothers. Social, creative, but disloyal, the chimpanzees wage wars over land, not mates. Chimps are promiscuous, polygamous, no parenting responsibilities in males. Mothers entirely take care of their infants. Cases of transactional sex, that is to say, meat for sex prostitution. Society like that does not provide any safety, trustworthy feelings, loyalty and compassion. They live in fear of betrayal and change. Scary resemblance with human society, don't you think? Then we have a Lemur Bamboo. Lemur lives alone and does not need a company. He wanders around alone. But Lemur Bamboo is an exception. Most of the primates are very sociable. New World monkeys are so sociable that they even create groups of different types of monkeys. And even with other types of animals, for example with parrots or other birds. The larger the group, the more abilities to be safe. Kind of European Union. Then we have Lemur's cutter that live in a big aggressive troops, constantly protecting their own territory from other troops. 
reduced sexual dimorphism, that is to say, without visible differences between male and female. Therefore, their social roles are equal and their social structure is based on gender equality. Females fight in the first lane, often carrying their infants on their backs. Lemurs form pair bonds, where females socially dominate males in all circumstances. Females are independent to such a degree that they choose to mate with other males, but they are not protected by any of them. The death rate of females and infants is very high. 50% of infants do not make it through their first year of life. Injured and stressed females can't provide a proper parenting and enough provision. Not being omnivores but vegetarians, they are constantly threatened with starvation and extinction. Lemurs is a strong case against extreme female-driven social systems. That's why the main course of Land of Good is gender harmony and not gender equality. Are there any examples of gender harmony in apes that you use as inspiration for Land of Good? Let me introduce you to bonobo chimpanzees, which is non-hierarchical, altruistic social organization. They have a leader, often a female, but without the privileges. No alpha, no omega, all pretty much equal, have collective property that they all can use if needed. They are creative, kind, compassionate and not ambitious. The leadership is taken by intellect and never by force. One gets democratically chosen for the leadership when it comes to a specific task. Various individuals lead different projects, nominating him or herself for a leader of, of the task. The bonobo must come up with something original. They rule with tolerance and intelligence. Not aggressive, not vegetarians, omnivores. Males and females are as heterosexual as homosexual. But the big question is, Will a society like that satisfy everybody? The answer is probably no. It looks like different genes are activated in different people. Some of us more bonobo, some more chimpanzees, some more baboons or lemurs, etc. Because of continuous migration, we are all mixed. People with prevailing chimpanzees genes started to live together with people with prevailing baboons genes or orangutan or chimps but we are always unconsciously will be longing to the system that is printed in our brain million years ago did you know that human genome is 98 percent identical with the chimpanzees genome 96 percent identical with gorillas once mutated, these genes are passed on from generation to generation as the transmitters of information. They are practically eternal. So instead of fighting with your nature, isn't it healthier to offer you a system where you will feel at home? But isn't it how our world is now? A certain country offers a certain kind of social and political structure. It looks like it, but in the reality our social structures is never a pure form of that one structure, but a combination of different structures. And there lays a problem. Check this out. We have a global structure with males leaders, the survival of the fittest and of the strongest, like in baboons. Within that structure, we have an unstable hierarchy depending on force or creativity of, of a particular male, like in chimpanzees. The background of that hierarchical structure is a strong institutionalized family structure like in Gibbons. Within this structure, we have the elements of gorillas and the elements of Lemur's kata, where females longing to gender equality. As a result, baboon people have to put up with gorilla people, chimpanzees with Lemur's, orangutans with um, bonobo. It's a mess. How will you solve this in Land of Good? Here is where female approach becomes so important. Because our foundation is gender harmony, we have to consider both 
masculine and feminine powers of the society. If for the masculine, the organization and the structure itself is very important, then for the feminine, it's the diversity. So bringing those two together, what do we get? The diversity of structures. So to say, a free choice between all available social structures in their independent forms. In our world, all structures are brought under one overall social structure, which makes it very complicated. For example, in Holland, there are many political parties, and they all have to answer to parliamentary democracy, plus constitutional monarchy, plus European Union. To use our apes allegory, bonobo, plus baboons, plus New World apes together, to keep a system like that is a complicated challenge. As a result, a lot of energy goes into fighting the consensus between the parties first, leaving a little space and time for the solving the actual problems. And that's the story of our world. There is never enough time and energy to make everybody happy, but time plenty for discussions and debates. So instead of proving each other wrong, we might as well try to understand each other better and be curious why other people might have something different in mind, literally. It's not a question of right and wrong. It's about what suits better to a particular individual. For that reason, we plan Land of Good to be a network of autonomous platforms. Each platform represents any willing political or non-political party, organization, initiative, way of life, etc. Such a platform should be an independent, self-sustainable unit, an organized community, a society on its own. We call it Ordex. I will share with you the sketches of the first Ordex soon. An Ordex is a safe settlement where people bind together because of their common needs and ideas, share the same philosophy and try to make it work for them without any opposition. Ordexes are interconnected but not interfering with each other unless agreed differently. So, hypothetically, if I want to establish Ordex of dictatorship, it will be allowed? <laughs> Uh, we see that all social structures are implanted in us since we were apes. We all feel which social structure suits us best. Some of us like to live in freedom, being responsible for our actions. And there are some of us who are fine with being leaded, following somebody else's decisions and even being controlled. Shocking? might sound like, but if we look at our ancestors, it all makes sense. There are people who feel secure and at ease when they trust completely the alpha leader. Some people might be better off with a good dictator. But dictators are known for their cruelty and violence. Do you have a smartphone? Yes. Well, Apple is a good example of a voluntary dictatorship. It dictates you what, when, and how to update your data, your most treasurable, treasurable possession, right? Do you ever read their contracts in small letters? But you sign it in blind trust that that alpha apple knows best. If you don't obey and don't update, in some time, your gadget stops working and you're exiled from all the planet. That's a dictatorship. But because Apple delivers what it promises, we might as well call it a constructive, voluntary dictatorship. So all structures will be allowed in land of good because the drive behind every ordex is the desire for goodness, the thrive to the perfection. Build an ordex communism, if you wish, with goodness and without violence. Achieve world domination without genocide. 
or world domination of love. How about challenge like that? Not to use violence for entertainment, but use goodness, creativity and knowledge. Prove to your people that your Ordex is the best for them. So to say, each political party should start its own community and should inspire the followers to settle down on one same location. This seems impossible in our world. It is impossible in our world. That's why we build it in VR. In virtual reality, we can let our imagination fly and see what happens then. I suppose we all do understand that with freedom comes a great responsibility. No man is free who is not master of himself. In the words of Greek philosopher Epictetus, so life in the land of good requires a highly educated, deep self-knowledge and the knowledge of the society. In our current reality, self-knowledge is superficial. We rely on science that uncovers 10, maximum 20% of everything. Seems like our science reaches its limits when it comes to remaining 80% black matter, 80% DNA sequences, 80% brain capacity. So if our technologies can't help us there, we need to come up with something out of the box or Rethink the box, as Michel Leroux, the founder of RethinkingTheBox.com, nicely suggested. So if we are looking for something new, why not to try the methods related to female powers, related to the third eye, related to the capacity of the pineal gland? Would be great to do actually a separate video on the recent discoveries of alternative technologies that involve sound, light and magnetism. What if we can reach our 100%? So let's explore towards our full potential in land of good. And if we're gonna do it with the help of the pioneer gland capacities, then to get to know your body, your ancestors line, and to learn about your feelings becomes the high priority. Would that be even possible? Not without a proper education. Therefore, land of good is not male, not female driven, but education driven society. Not the education as we know it, not only the practical knowledge, but especially self-knowledge. And self-knowledge education starts, surprisingly, with the contributing to the others. Through serving the others, you grow. They are your teachers and your students. Our reality tells us that the road to feel good is paved by the materialistic stuff. Money, things, cars, properties, villas. But we all know you can be rich and miserable. In Land of Good, the criterion of feel good will be not the past and not the future, but how it feels now and here. Do you remember when they asked the yogi hermit, who lives in the mountains in the state of total bliss, they asked him whether he's happy or not. He was confused and amused. Apparently, he never thinks about it. He just is to enjoy the benefits. If I feel good today, I can contribute something good to the society. If I feel bad, I find the way to improve it. Of course, such self-balancing requires a profound education that will be introduced to you since childhood. Kids should be educated in the disciplines of freedom, peace and happiness, so-called emotional education, the EQ together with the IQ. At schools, children should learn how to love yourself, how to love the others, how to be a good partner, parent, a good citizen. Of course, in Land of Good, it will be easier for the kids because hypothetically they are already born in circumstances like that. 
they are brought up with the knowledge and solutions how to generate good emotions between people, good energy, and how to maintain this energy. I actually would really like to dedicate a separate video to the education system because it's a super important topic. And with the education comes the mother figure. The mother figure? As we said, land of good will be a wide variety of autonomous ordexes. You are entirely free in everything you do. And the Great Mother will keep an eye on it all. The Great Mother is not what we understand under the mom. The Great Mother is the guard of the emotional health. She's highly educated and deserved her position by showing extraordinary abilities in thought leadership, communication, management, justice, problem solving, contributionism, in education and in medicine. The Great Mother will always have a solution. This is what she is trained to do her whole life. She will have an army of helpers ready to solve any possible challenge. This gives a very secure, very safe feeling to everyone in Land of Good. Each Ordex will have its own Great Mother. All Great Mothers will be connected by a global network. And what if men will try to compete with women over the control? They are not women, they are mothers. There is a difference. Because the relationship between men and their mothers excludes competition. Men don't want to compete with their mothers, they want their love. And if they get plenty, plus they are free in all their adventures, what else can men wish for? Great mothers always know what's best for their children. Would anybody want to refuse such a refined safety net in life? Besides, as we discussed in the previous video, there will always be a dual leading. Men will lead together with women. But above all, it's not about genders, but about skills and talents. Therefore, the Great Mother should not necessarily even be a female. If a man shows the most extraordinary abilities in the mothership, he will be asked to take this position. Without the special abilities, no one will be able to manage an Ordex, because Ordex is not very keen on to be disturbed in its daily goals of joy. Are competition and war not the drive behind the progress? Competition, progress, world domination, all these kind of concepts of our reality are created in order to keep people busy. Our current male-driven progress is at least 10,000 years old and still not long enough to deliver well-being to everyone. So I lost my interest in this progress. Sorry. In Land of Good People will be busy with pursuing their own good life instead of serving the system that promises good life and doesn't deliver. So, Land of Good will be an alliance of different social structures, united by the overall system of the Great Mothers? The Mother is not a system. The Mother is your consciousness. It's difficult to imagine for us that there could be an altruistic, guilt-free somebody who will help you whatever troubles you got in. Maybe only my grandmother comes close, but she's gone a long time ago. The Great Mother is not necessarily your direct family relationship, but she is always there for you. In the end of the day, we are all relying on somebody who can help, who can show the way. Kindness of a stranger is one of our survival techniques. Always been. For that reason, kindness becomes very important in Land of Wood, and so is the Great Mother. You mentioned contributionism earlier. What is that exactly? Uh, contributionism will be one of the disciplines that the Great Mothers would master. Do you mean they have to study how to contribute? Yes, the art of gifting and receiving. 
contributionism term is introduced by Michael Tellinger in South Africa. Contributionism is the way how to serve the society. You contribute your abilities and knowledge to somebody else. The same way the others will contribute their work to you. Contributionism is based on the principle of gifting. John Stein from Hub Nation described it very well. I quote, Gifting is what happens on the Christmas morning when you give something to somebody not with intention to receive something back, but with an intention of trying to make their life or a day or a moment a little bit better. It only works when people learn how to receive. So the art of gifting and receiving concerns not only the economic matters. In land of good, contributionism also concerns social structure because it defines the way people interact. Do I understand correctly that such typical characteristics of our current reality as nationality, country, passport will die out in land of good? They won't be there in the first place unless someone wants to organize a structure of registered citizenship within their own orders. As long as you don't disturb or distract yourself and people around you, How will you keep people on account? The great mother knows her children. I like this idea of great mother and of the multiple choices. Is there any way to apply it in our reality? (sighs) Not really. We are missing that emotional intelligence part. To be able to achieve collective conjunction on such a big scale, women need to rediscover their true powers first. The role of women is so diminished in our world that without rebalancing it first, who is going to lead this project next to men? Women need to unite, communicate and collaborate with each other, like men who have a whole range of organized powers, political parties, economical institutions, armies, police, powerful religions, sport clubs, media and now internet, do women have anything like that? Feminism movement is infiltrating into the existing systems and networks, which is already a big deal. But forced to play by the men's rules, it's difficult for the feminists to organize an independent network aside. If women want to change something, they need to start investing in the new non-electricity kind of technologies and in the new schooling system, in the new ways to consume products and food, building their own networks. Of course, it's, um, it's a little bit of a fantasy what I just described. But as an artist, I am entitled to create something like that. In thoughts, on paper, in video, and later, finally, in VR. Great, Vika, and thank you. Unfortunately, our time is up. Until we meet again on the next topic, will it be the education? Uh, We will see. I think so. Now that we have the fundament and the structure, We need walls, floors, and tunnels. So, to be continued. Thank you very much for your time.